We have a problem. The world's population is growing. It's estimated that by 2050, we will have 10 billion people living on the surface of the Earth. Over two thirds of the world population will be living in cities. And these people need to eat. The digital age we live in sometimes feels like magic. I mean, we carry computers in our pockets and are able to shoot people into space. But at the same time, one in nine people are starving. Despite technological progress in agriculture, food production is one of the big industries that is destroying our planet. In the Amazon, rainforests are burned down to create soy plantations to feed livestock. In southern Spain, strawberry farming is drying out the land. And water scarcity is a global problem. All around the world, nature is being harmed by food production. Is this what we want? We went to the Netherlands to take a closer look at a potential solution to this problem. I don't want to sleep, ain't ready to eat, I just want to creep around my way. It's been a long week, now I'm in the Jeep with the Dutch treat, scoop a couple peeps, let's go play. The Netherlands is a tiny country, it's over 200 times smaller than the US. But despite its small size, the Netherlands is the world's second largest exporter of food by dollar value. Only the United States export more, and the Dutch do it by precision farming, high-tech agriculture. They boast they have developed one of the most efficient agriculture systems in the world, and they may be onto something that mankind will need, because as the world's population increases, food demand will rise. Today we're right in the heart of Food Valley, the Dutch equivalent to Silicon Valley, and this is Wageningen University. This university is one of the driving forces of the Dutch agricultural industry. People here are looking for ways to sustainably feed the world in the coming years. Meet Leo Marcellus. He's a plant scientist. Here this is a research setup where we are testing different growth conditions. At the moment we are comparing different types of color. You're testing different colors on how the plant works basically. Yes, so it is about the color of the light, but it's also about what moment of the day, the carbon dioxide concentration, humidity, temperature, wind flow. So let me paraphrase. Basically, they collect as much data as they can about how a plant grows. And we integrate that knowledge in simulation models, in computer models of how the plant is growing. Plants grow through a process called photosynthesis. To put it simply, the cells in the plant turn sunlight into sugar. Leo and his team use sensors to measure this process. So we clip this on the leaf, yep. and when there is photosynthesis, the plant takes up CO2, carbon dioxide, and this machine measures in fact how much carbon dioxide is taken out of the air. What we want this type of information, now we know how the photosynthesis is doing, then we combine that with computer models that simulate how the plant is performing and these type of data we make the models in fact more accurate. So you, you combine the knowledge that you already have about this plant and the data that you collect here to make yes. the growth of the plant even better. Or, yes, and right. with those models if we can predict with a model how it would perform, how it would also perform at a bit different conditions as this, we can explore what would be the best set of conditions. Do we need to change the brightness of the light, the color of the light, the temperature? Okay, stop. So scientists like Leo are developing computer models to create the best possible growing conditions for plants. But what does this have to do with smart cities of the future? To find out more, we're traveling to Westland a region that people have dubbed the food factory 
of the Netherlands. This is the World Horty Center, a crossover between a school for precision farming and a convention center for agriculture. We're going to meet a company that's building some of the most modern indoor farms in the world. My name is Joep van der Bos, and I'm Chief Innovation Officer of the Ridder Group. I'm responsible for innovation in greenhouse technology. Here, this is a demo center for doing experiments to gain knowledge about how to grow. And in every of these zones, you see crops. This is a pepper crop. We have a cucumber crop. We have a tomato crop. People in the plant industry are aware of the challenges the world is facing. They even made a film about it. To literally eat this. To know what gives us air to breathe and then start cutting down these trees to put wealth over health, to see the world of the future burning, but only focus on today's earning. It's concerning how little we're actually learning. So eat this if you think we don't have enough space to feed the rapidly growing human race. This manifesto was produced by an international platform that in their own words wants to promote healthy and sustainable solutions to feed the world. Eat this is backed by companies like Ritter that build greenhouses for them Precision farming is the solution. The population in the world is increasing, but also the population in cities is increasing. So we need more food. Do we have enough water to, to grow our food? Do we have enough water in Africa? In China we have a water issue. We don't have reliable food production in a lot of places anymore. very much used to use fertilizer. We know already by now that some of the fertilizers will run out in 20 or 30 years. So what to do then? The question is how will we in the end uh, feed 10 billion people? We want to do it in a sustainable way and we don't want to do it more sustainable than it is now. I think that's a, that's a real challenge. But if unreliable weather conditions lie at the heart of the problem, why not get rid of unpredictable weather? So instead of producing your food and flowers outside, the first part of the solution is creating a controlled environment. To me, the vision is that controlled environment agriculture is one of the main solutions for producing food in an economically good way, but also uh, in a sustainable way. It's about the energy use, it's about the water use, it's about nutrient use. Land use is also one. And all those aspects can be further improved. And a controlled environment can be as simple as a, as a plastic cover, or as advanced as the greenhouse here uh, today with uh, additional lighting, LEDs, uh, water risk circulation, all the sensors that you need. And the, the solution for the future is the mix of those different growing systems. You can control the greenhouse from your laptop on the beach. You don't have to be there. The, the technology is there to control the climate and to make sure the plants are watered on time, they get the right amount of energy. This is a, a light sensor. So this sensor measures the amount of light that comes into the greenhouse. Yeah. Because light is the main growing factor for plants. And if there's more light, plants need more water. They need more fertilizer. They can have a higher temperature. Yeah. So light sensor is, an, uh, is an, uh, a key element. As the world's temperature increases, water consumption will become critical. Loin des venins, des voiceurs, déconnectés, j'ai les railleurs. On me dit agis comme un acteur, mais je trouve pas le rôle qui m'aille. D'ailleurs, j'écris la nuit dans la nuit. A circular economy plays a big role in modern agriculture. All the plants here are grown on gutters. Every excess drop of water that is not used by the plants is collected and reused. That dramatically increases efficiency. 
growing it in this way, you only use 10% of the water consumption that you will use to, do, to grow the same amount of tomatoes outside. So outside takes 10 times the amount of water. And the, the trick is recirculation of water. To reach that level of efficiency, greenhouses need to have sensors and computers that monitor all the important conditions for optimal growth. This instrument is sucking air in from the greenhouse and inside this box there's a temperature, humidity and CO2 sensor. Computer control determines based on the, the knowledge of what the crop needs, together with the sensors, what exactly the amount of water is the plant is getting, including the amount of fertilizer that is needed by the plants. The control system controls those motors. Those motors, they can control the ventilation, so the roofs for cooling, they can control the screening to put a sunscreen on if the sun is too hot. This equipment is already standard for every modern greenhouse. But what the industry is striving for now is to make these greenhouses smart by using the information collected by the sensors. How do we do this? How do we grow? All these things generate a lot of data already. Only having this set of data doesn't mean anything. You have to transfer that data into information and actionable insights. We optimize the growth conditions, but also that we can predict when to harvest, how much to harvest, of what quality. But to really understand how a plant grows with all the physiology in it, uh, and really try to mimic that and improve it, that's where artificial intelligence combined with knowledge that's already there can really improve uh, uh, the, the products and the plant uh, growing. So we can control everything. We know exactly what we produce, so we can predict on that specific day we can produce this quality and this quantity and we can do it anywhere. And of course, these produces are biological systems. So these are sometimes a little bit more uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to mimic and to, to digitalize. But I think we are well on our way with additional sensors and with the knowledge of how a plant works, that you can even make a digital twin of a tomato, for example. A digital twin is basically a computer program with a recipe for growing plants. Like a baking recipe, it tells your smart greenhouse which ingredients and what amounts are needed for the best possible result. A grower that is growing tomatoes all his life, knows everything about the tomatoes, can get a control system and with a push of a button, he's a specialist in growing peppers. People can switch and be a specialist in something by just using technology. What is your vision for the future? If you could see ahead 20 years from now, what do you imagine? So my vision is that we produce in a sustainable way, that we produce very nearby those big cities. It's not necessarily really inside the city, but very nearby, maybe on the outskirts. And we will stop transporting food all over the world. I mean, it's not solving everything, of course, but it's, uh, you can have more local food production. Grow it locally low food miles and as efficient as possible. If we now can grow plants on a very limited land area, we need much less land for producing the food than we would use in, ag in traditional agriculture. Think about what you can do with all that land. You could also give it back to nature. And do you think smart agriculture is the answer to hunger on the world? Is it the silver bullet? It, no, there is not one silver bullet. And these greenhouses and vertical farm are in particular very suitable for fresh vegetables. So that's important for world hunger. But for world hunger, there's more. There's also all the corn. And I don't think we will grow corn in these facilities. I believe we can double the amount of food that we produce with half of the resources. Just by using the intelligence from, say, the people in the Westland or other areas in the world where they have the knowledge, capture that knowledge and transplant it to areas where they don't have the knowledge today. 
Yeah, amazing. So when will we have it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. What, what do you think? I, I think very, very, very fast. I, I believe that in 10 years from now, this greenhouse will be completely autonomous. So there is uh, no longer human needed. We have uh, artificial intelligence and robots running the greenhouse. And we have just have people that are managing the facility. In general, we can say agriculture is turning into a high-tech sector. Well, at least in Europe. And creating the perfect growing conditions for plants in the Arctic, in the desert, or even on the moon sounds great. But I wonder if underdeveloped regions of the world will really be able to shoulder such an investment. Don't get me wrong, technology will get cheaper and make our lives better. But if we want to feed 10 billion people, we're not going to stop growing crops outside. And if you want to talk about the environment, there's one small thing we didn't touch on, and that's the impact of livestock. Indoor farming is not the answer to all our problems, but it could be an answer. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. I worked really hard on it. I hope you can tell. Um, if you want more content like this, subscribe to our channel on DW Shift, activate the notification bell, and I'll see you in the next one.